welcome everyone to the first seminar in this term series for the Center for Educational Neuroscience uh, seminar series. It is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore uh, to give today's seminar. Uh, Sarah Jane was actually uh, a founder member, can I call you that, a founder member of the Center for Educational Neuroscience, and I hesitate to say how long ago that was, uh, 2008, I mean, it's something like 2008, and uh, I remember uh, sitting in an uh, interview uh, at a, at a charitable trust uh, bidding for a, for a large grant with uh, uh, with Sarah Jane many years ago. Uh, Sarah Jane was then at the UCL and she subsequently moved to uh, University of Cambridge where she is the leader of the Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience Group and uh, her group's research focuses on the development of social cognition and decision making in the human adolescent brain and adolescent mental health. Uh, I'm gonna encourage you to, to go have a look at, at Sarah Jane's TED's talk. Uh, have you checked recently how many views you've had on that, Sarah Jane? Uh, no. I can, I, as of yesterday, uh, I, can, I can say uh, that it's uh, 3,682,033. So um, yeah, join everyone else and, and uh, go look at that fantastic talk looking at uh, adolescent uh, brain development. Uh, Sarah Jane's gonna be talking to us today uh, about the development of the social brain in adolescents uh, and in particular in, in relevance to, to the pandemic, uh, the effects of social distancing. So Sarah Jane, welcome and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, let me know if you can't hear me, just shout out. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen, hopefully. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Is that all okay? Yeah, that looks great. Brilliant. Okay, so my TED talk, oh my gosh, that was 10 years ago, believe it or not. And it was on the adolescent brain, but it's quite, I, was, I haven't watched it for 10 years. Um, so I watched it when it first came out and thought, I'm never looking at that again. And I was just thinking, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued to watch it just to know whether I would give anything like a similar talk if I gave the same 15 minute talk now. <laughs> I'm not sure I would. Um, Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, development of the social brain in adolescence. And right at the end, I'll talk uh, briefly about sort of speculations about the effects of um, social distancing and social isolation, which is the current topic or the topic of my current research. Okay, so the reason I got interested, became interested in adolescent brain development is because I did my PhD at UCL um, with Chris Frith and Daniel Wolpert. And during my PhD, I was focused on, my research was focused on schizophrenia. I then went on to, uh, to do a postdoc on schizophrenia in France. And um, I became interested in the fact that schizophrenia, which as you know, is a psychiatric condition that's characterized by very frightening symptoms like uh, auditory hallucinations and paranoid delusions. Um, I became interested in the fact that every patient I asked, what age did you start experiencing these symptoms? There wasn't a single exception. Hundreds of patients in hospitals um, that I was testing said at some age between about 18 and 26. So I became really interested in why this is. What is it about teenage brain development that is different in teenagers who go on to develop these horrible symptoms of schizophrenia compared with teenagers who don't? Now that was in the early 2000s. I looked in the scientific literature and to my surprise back then, there was very little known about uh, teenage, human teenage brain development. There were a couple of studies, but there was virtually nothing really uh, understood about it and that at that point that's when I decided to change the focus of my own research and start to study the adolescent brain and that's what I've been doing ever since so that's a bit of background now it's not just schizophrenia that has its onset in in adolescence most mental health problems start at some point in adolescence it's been estimated that 75 percent of mental illness first appears before the age of 24 and you can see that in this graph here what this shows is the average age range of onset for a variety of different developmental uh, conditions and mental health 
problems. And you can see that the onset for the most mental health problems clusters around um, the teenage years and the early 20s. Um, and so in some ways, that is the kind of major motivator of a lot of this area of research. That's what, why a lot of people are really interested in understanding development uh, during adolescence to try to solve the problem of why um, so many mental health problems, why this seems to be a period of vulnerability for so many mental health problems. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about, I very briefly talk about what I mean by adolescence. I'll then talk about um, some of our research on social brain development, um, some of our behavioral studies on peer influence, um, and finally, I'll talk about the effects of social isolation, social distancing and loneliness in adolescence. So what is adolescence? Well, you can define adolescence in lots of different ways. And actually, over the course of my research over the last 18 years, I've changed the way I define adolescence. And I won't bore you with the various different definitions I've used over the, over the, um, the, the period of uh, time that I've been working on it. But the current way we define adolescence was, pro um, was proposed by Susan Sawyer and her colleagues a couple of years ago. And that is the age between 10 and 24 years in humans. That is a very wide developmental period, developmental range, um, range. And the reason they suggest that this um, rather broad age range should be considered as adolescence is because of the new findings of uh, brain development which, during adolescence, which covers this uh, age range. And that's, I'll come back to that quite soon. Now, when you think about adolescence, you might think about kind of Adolescent typical behaviors like risk taking and impulsivity and peer influence. Um, and those kinds of stereotypical behaviors that we often associate with adolescents, um, you might think that they are only associated with adolescents in today's society and modern Western societies, but that's absolutely not the case. And um, in fact, if you look at historical descriptions of adolescents, you see striking similarities across history with the way we describe, we typically describe adolescence today in quite a kind of negative stereotyped way. So I will just show you an example. So that first of all, just to say, this is a unique period of biological, psychological and social development, but it isn't really anything new that this period of development um, has been documented across history as I'm gonna show you next. So this is, this is a quote by Socrates. Socrates wrote a lot about adolescence. He referred to them as youth. And he said things like that. He was very negative about them. He said things like they have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. Aristotle too wrote a lot about youth. And he said, he wrote large passages about them. And he said things like they're passionate, irascible, apt to be carried away by their impulses. This is the age when people are most devoted to their friends. I've highlighted that sentence because that is a theme that I'm gonna come back to throughout this talk. So um, that was just a brief example of how these kind of adolescent typical, very um, stereotypical in a way and quite negative descriptions that we often associate with adolescence and is nothing new. But what we what is new is our understanding of neurocognitive development in adolescence. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about how uh, the adolescent social brain develops and also a bit about how the brain develops more broadly in adolescence. OK, so what I mean by the social brain is this network of brain regions that are active that is activated when we think about other people's minds. In other words, when we do mentalizing tasks, um, there are various different um, regions of the brain activated when you think about someone else's mind. What I mean by that is thinking about their mental states, their intentions, their emotions, their desires, their beliefs. It's remarkable how consistent the many hundreds now of um, neuroimaging studies in adults have been in terms of the um, activation of this uh, circumscribed brain network of regions. And they include the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, the anterior temporal cortex, the uh, temporoparietal junction, and the posterior superior temporal sulcus. So what we're interested in in our research is how does this network of brain regions, how does this social brain network develop in adolescence. And we have looked at that both in terms of its functional development, so activity during mentalizing tasks, how that changes with age, 
and also its structural development. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So um, in this study the, that I'm about to describe, our main question is, how does this network of brain regions, which we know from adult studies is involved in mentalizing, how does it develop structurally in adolescence? So this was a um, study carried out by my former PhD student, Kate Mills. Uh, Kate is now assistant professor at the University of Oregon. And in this study, that she did during her PhD with Jay Geed and me, um, we looked at gray matter volume in the social brain network and how that changes with age. Um, so in this study, there were 288 participants, about half of whom were female, aged between seven to 30 years. Each participant was scanned multiple times. So this was a longitudinal study. It was actually an accelerated longitudinal longitudinal design for those who are interested in these kinds of things. Um, this was the NIA, NIMH pediatric um, uh, uh, cohort that Jay Geed set up. And we were really focused on these four regions of the brain defined by their activation in recent meta-analyses of mentalizing studies in adults. So I'm just gonna show you the results. Okay, so this is how gray matter changes across age in a longitudinal study uh, in each of these four regions. And I'll just explain what these show. You might not be able to see them very well on, 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 uh, on the screen. Okay, so first of all, what you see on the x-axis is age and years, and on the y-axis is gray matter volume. Um, and what you can see is that in each of these regions, gray matter volume follows a very similar trajectory. It's actually most, the, be the trajectory of best fit is a cubic trajectory, but quadratic and linear uh, are also significant. And the, mo the most important thing to note is that in all four regions, uh, gray matter volume is highest in late childhood. So this, for example, in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex starts at around age eight and goes up to around age 23 years. Um, so it's highest in late childhood, and then it undergoes a very, very substantial decline across adolescence. The decline is represented on the y-axis by this percentage. This is the percentage decline in gray matter volume from the peak to the trough. So in dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, that's 17%. And similarly high percentages in these sort of posterior temporal regions and a slightly lower, um, less steep decline uh, in the anterior temporal cortex, but nevertheless a decline. So this seems to be a pattern of um, uh, structural brain development that you can see across these four different areas. So the next question to ask is, is this very substantial and protracted development in the social brain network, is that special? Is that specific to the social brain network or does this occur across the whole brain? And the answer is it's actually very similar <laughs> across most of the cortex. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. So this is, um, Another study led by Kate Mills and our collaborator Christian Tamners from Oslo, where uh, we analyzed data of um, structural brain development from four different cohorts, four different samples of participants. So those samples, those cohorts came from four different places, NIMH in America, Pittsburgh in America, Leiden in the Netherlands and Oslo in, North, in Norway. So in other words, these four cohorts are groups of participants in completely different countries or cities who are being, their children and adolescents who are being scanned every couple of years as they get older. In total, there were 391 participants across all four sites. Each participant was scanned at least twice. So again, these are all accelerated longitudinal designs and the total number of MRI scans that were analyzed were at 852. So I'm gonna show you a couple of results. There are many, many results from this study, as you can imagine, it's a huge amount of data. Um, so first I'm gonna show you cortical gray matter volume. So this is gray matter volume averaged across the entire cortex. For those of you who are not neuroscientists, there might be some people in the audience who are not scientists at all, because I know this was advertised on Twitter, the cortex is the surface area of the brain. Um, and what you can see here is the cortical gray matter volume, so average across the whole cortex on the y-axis, plotted against age and years from five to 30 years on the x-axis. And the, the different color lines correspond to the developmental trajectories, the developmental change in cortical gray matter volume in the four different cohorts. So the four different um, groups of participants. And the first thing to notice is how remarkably similar 
um, the trajectories are for each of the four cohorts. So in some ways, this is a kind of replication, sort of internal replication study um, where we have replicated the trajectory three times, if you like. And that trajectory, you might notice, is very similar to the trajectory I just showed for the individual regions of the social brain network. It's a cubic trajectory, at least cubic is the line of best fit. And it's highest in, um, so gray matter increases during childhood, it's highest in late childhood, and then it undergoes this very substantial decline during adolescence and stabilizes into the 20s. Now, one thing to note is that um, different regions, so this is averaging across the entire cortex, but different regions of the cortex do have a slightly different uh, shape of development. And that's what I'm gonna show you here. So these are data from the same um, analysis. Um, you don't need to see the you know, individual data points. It's just to make the point, okay, so that this is cortical thickness here surface area and their product volume. I just showed you volume. Um, and these, this, these three measures are taken from the four different lobes. So frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobe. My point of showing you this is just to say that the occipital lobe is a kind of outlier here. So occipital lobe, which is the part of the brain that processes the visual world around you. So it's a sensory region, um, develops earlier than the other parts of the cortex, the other lobes. Um, it, it doesn't change very much in terms of thickness or surface area or volume after about age 13 or 14. Whereas the other regions, frontal, parietal, and temporal cortices, which are, as you know, involved in much higher level cognitive processing of all sorts, <laughs> um, undergo this very uh, protracted and substantial decline, mostly in thickness, but also to a certain extent in surface area, and then of course volume um, across adolescence. Now, as gray matter is declining across adolescence in most of the cortex, um, gray, white matter volume is doing exactly the opposite. So cerebral white matter, that is white matter averaged across the entire, cort entri entire brain, uh, that shows a significant linear increase um, in, in, um, in volume across adolescence. There is about um, a 1% increase annually uh, during adolescence of white matter volume um, compared to a approximately 1.5% annual decrease in gray matter volume, cortical gray matter volume during adolescence. Now, a main, you know, a big question, which is asked by many people uh, is, What's going on here? Why does gray matter volume decline and white matter volume increase during adolescence? Um, and in some ways, we can only really speculate <clears throat> about what, what cellular processes underlie these um, changes in gray matter volume and white matter volume. And that is because although MRI scans um, give us, you know, fantastic images of the brain, which we didn't have until you know, 25 years ago, in, at least for the developing brain. And they have really changed the way we think about brain development, showing that the brain continues to develop, not just in childhood, but also throughout adolescence, as I've just shown you. Um, MRI doesn't yet have the resolution to tell us very much at all about the brain at the level of the cell or the synapse. We're, it's, it's rapidly evolving and technology is improving, but we can't really say very much about that yet. Um, about the microstructure of the developing, the living, developing human brain. Uh, so we can only make an educated guess based on animal research and post-mortem human brain tissue research. And just very, very briefly, what that research has shown us is that there are three neurodevelopmental processes happening across childhood and adolescence that possibly account for these changes in gray matter and white matter volumes. And they are axonal myelination and axonal growth. So as, as some of you will know, but pro probably not all of you, the axons are the fibers attached to each neuron in each brain cell, along which electrical impulses pass. Uh, and this is how cells in the brain communicate with each other. They pass electrical signals along their axon that is then transmitted to other neurons in the surrounding area. <clears throat> now in development, we know from decades, if not a century of uh, research in animals, that um, as uh, from very early on actually in humans, like second trimester, I think, 
Um, uh, as, as the um, organism develops, the axons become myelinated. They become coated with a substance, a fatty substance called myelin. And that effectively insulates sort of <laughs> the axon and means that the transmission of electrical signals uh, um, passes down the axon faster. So it speeds up the processing um, or the, 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 the signal uh, um, conduction speed. Axonal growth, that is where axons, so they're kind of, you can think of them as like long fibers, long tubes, they grow in diameter. That also happens from very early on in development. And we know that both of those things are, are still happening in the human brain right throughout adolescence and even into the 20s and 30s. And they will um, show up, if you like, in the MRI scan as an increase in white matter. So as axons become myelinated, myelin um, appears white under the microscope. And so it's kind of color coded as white matter in MRI scans. So as, as um, axons are myelinated and grow in diameter, that corresponds to an increase in white matter and a concomitant decrease in gray matter. That's really important. This decrease in gray matter is largely the result of brain tissue becoming more white and less gray as seen by MRI scans. Another neurodevelopmental process that is happening in right, right throughout um, childhood and adolescence in some regions is synaptic pruning. So synapse is the connections between brain cells. Um, the brain overproduces synapses in early development so that a, a young brain contains many more connections than an adult brain. And then what happens after this early excess production of synapses is that um, those ex excess synapses need to be pruned away. And this is um, really an important neurodevelopmental process because it partly depends on the environment that the animal or the child is in, in that synapses that are being used in a particular environment are the synapses that remain in the brain and synapses that are not being used in a particular environment are the synapses that get pruned away. Now, synapses are mostly found in the gray matter um, and so as synaptic pruning occurs during adolescence, that will um, correspond to or show up as a, a decrease in gray matter in MRI, in MRI scans. Now, synapses are tiny and probably synaptic pruning only accounts for a very small amount of the decrease in gray matter volume. Now, the important thing about these three neurodevelopmental processes that we know are happening in adolescence is that they are mechanisms, they are all mechanisms that pro promote neuroplasticity. That is the, um, the way the brain adapts according to what environment it's in. Um, and that is why most people who work in this area now think of adolescence as a sensitive period of brain development, um, just like childhood is. Okay, so one last thing I want to say about brain development is that I and most papers you read about brain development in adolescence really focus in on averages. Remember those nice lines of best fit I showed you? Well, averages hide a lot of important information about individual differences. Individual differences in development, both um, at a brain level and a cognitive level, are vast. And you can see that here. So the, this is the same graph that I showed you before, showing cortical gray matter volume in the four different cohorts. I showed you the lines of best fit, which you can still see here. What I didn't show you before is the raw data, and that's what you see behind. So this is raw data from actual individual children and adolescents as they're getting older. And what you can see is the individual difference, both in individual differences, both in terms of intercept and slope are huge. So, you know, you have, let's take, I don't know, age 11, you have some 11 year old, 11 year olds whose brain uh, volumes are right up here, others are right down here. That's the intercept differences. You also have differences in slope. So you have some young people whose brains lose a lot of gray matter early in adolescence, and then it kind of stabilizes out in late adolescence. You have other um, young people whose brains don't change very much at all in early adolescence and then undergo this decline in later adolescence. Now, what what those, um, what those individual differences are caused by, the genetic and environmental contributions to those individual differences in brain development, plus what they mean in terms of outcome is what a lot of people are now focusing their research on. So like one example, just to go back to <clears throat> the beginning of the talk where I talked about mental health problems, one hypothesis that many people are studying <clears throat> is that the difference, individual differences in, um, in neurodevelopmental trajectories might uh, correspond to um, uh, mental well-being. Like for example, 
Um, does, the, does the specific slope of change at different ages um, indicate anything about whether someone is likely to develop a mental health problem? Okay, so I am going to now um, talk about some of our behavioral research. So we do a lot of behavioral research, particularly interested in social behavior in adolescence, but also ver various other behaviors like decision-making and risk-taking. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on some of our recent work on how looking at how peers influence adolescent behavior. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to um, start by talking a little bit about risk-taking. Now, there is a huge amount of research, particularly over the, in the last decade or two, on risk-taking in adolescence. Um, what I mean by that is like experimental psychology and cognitive neuroscience research looking at risk taking. It's a big topic of interest for many colleagues around the world. And that is probably because um, there is a quite a lot of evidence that adolescents show a heightened propensity to take risks. And sometimes those risks can go wrong. We know, for example, that the leading cause of mortality of death in people aged between 10 and 24 years is accidents, mostly caused by risk taking. So um, I think that's probably why there is such a you know, profound interest in risk taking, trying to understand why this is might, um, help try to prevent these, in a way, these preventable deaths and also morbidity resulting from risk taking. Now, it's not as simple as I'm sure you're thinking that it's not as simple as all adolescents take lots of risks. Of course, that's not the case. Again, there are huge individual differences. Some adolescents are um, do show a heightened tendency to take risks, but many don't. And another thing to say about risk taking is that risk taking is often really useful and beneficial. We, we learn through risk taking, we learn by trial and error. <clears throat> we need to explore our environment and adolescence is a particularly important time for the exploration of one's environment and in, in a kind of need to become independent from one's parents, you need to explore and probably take more risks for that reason. And finally, the context of risk taking is really important at all ages actually, but particularly in adolescence. And one context that plays a, uh, a big role in adolescent risk taking is the social context. We know that adolescents are much more likely to take risks when they're with their friends than when they're on their own. I and mean, you can think about like risk taking that we all worry about adolescents taking. So things like um, I don't know, experimenting with drugs, smoking, binge drinking, dangerous driving. These are risks that if an adolescent takes them, they're much more likely to take them when they're with their friends than when they're alone. And you can see that it's not just anecdotal. You can see that in lots of different epidemiological studies, data from car insurance companies, lab-based studies. I'll just show you one example. So this is an example from the American Automobile Association. Uh, a few years ago, this, what this graph shows is the percentage increase in death risk, so the risk of a fatal accident, when drivers under the age of 21 carry passengers versus no passengers. So this is the increased risk, is about a 40% increased risk when young drivers carry one passenger in the car, and then the risk of a, um, a fatal accident increases pretty much exponentially with each additional passenger. There is something about um, having a friend or a passenger with them that increases the likelihood of them driving badly or taking a risk and having a fatal accident. And actually, this, as I said, this has been supported by many, many different studies and in fact has been um, incorporated into policy in various countries like in Canada and Australia. Young people, I think, are not allowed to drive uh, on their own for a certain amount of time after they've passed their test. Sorry, they're not allowed to drive, they're only allowed to drive on their own. They're not allowed to drive with passengers in the car for a certain amount of time after they've passed their test. And some car insurance companies offer reduced premiums for young people as long as they don't carry passengers in their car. So we're really interested in this effect. Why is it that young people, um, young people's decisions and behavior changes when they're with uh, their friends. And so that's what we've spent um, the last few years looking at. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of our studies. So this is a study looking at social influence on risk perception 
this was a study carried out by Lisa Noll. In fact, she carried out two identical studies a couple of years apart, and I'll come back to that. Um, uh, uh, she was my um, postdoc. She now works in the private sector doing um, big data analysis. Just as a little aside, for those of you who might be PhD students or postdocs, one really exciting thing I think that's happened in since I was a postdoc, when I was a postdoc, it was very difficult actually to um, change trajectories and get a job outside science. Like it wasn't easy to get a job in science either, but it was, there weren't that many jobs for people who trained as, you know, done a PhD in tra and, and postdoctoral research uh, outside science. I, I, what we're finding is there are now so many exciting opportunities for, for um, early career researchers that are not only in science, but using your scientific knowledge or your scientific training or your methods training in Lisa's case she analyzes really big data sets for a consultancy outside in the in the private sector and in other sectors like the third uh, uh, like the charity sector um anyway that's just a little aside which I always find kind of interesting how these things change how culture changes okay so in this study um uh we tested 563 participants <clears throat> about half of whom are female, aged between eight and 59 years. It's a very straightforward paradigm um, where you are presented with various different scenarios. Each scenario carries a certain amount of risk or is designed to carry a certain amount of risk. Like for example, here you see crossing a street uh, on a red light. Other um, scenarios were things like uh, driving without a seatbelt or cycling without a helmet or swimming in a lake at night by yourself. And you're asked to rate how risky you think this behavior is. So you just use the computer mouse and tell us, click how risky you think this behavior is. And then you're told, okay, all the teenagers who've taken part in this experiment so far, this is their average uh, risk rating for the same scenario. Okay, now this in fact is just a cover story. And this provided rating wasn't really from other participants. It was from, it was just randomly generated by the computer. And in a different condition, participants were told that the provided rating came from adults. So that was a kind of key um, independent manipula variable manipulation in our study. Um, so then we asked people to rate the same scenario again. And what we're really interested in is whether people change their ratings. Do people change their risk ratings from time one to time two? in the direction of the provided rating. In other words, are participants socially influenced in terms of their risk perception? And what we're really interested in, because we, we absolutely knew they would be, because 50 years of social psychology research has shown that we are very influenced by other people's views and attitudes. <clears throat> so our main interest here, and our kind of novel interest, is whether people would be more socially influenced by adults rate risk ratings compared with teenagers risk ratings and that's what i'm going to show you next <clears throat> so what you see here is a graph with the five different age groups that we included in our study so these down here are the participants um, their age and years is here so children aged 8 to 11 young adults sorry, young adolescents aged 12 to 14, mid-adolescents 15 to 18, young adults and adults. And what you see on the X, on the y-axis is um, whether they're more influenced by adults or by teenagers. If they are more influenced by adults than by teenagers, the bar will be, be below the zero line. That's what we hypothesized, and that's what we found for three groups, the children and the two adult groups. They were all more influenced. They were influenced by both teenagers and adults, but they were more influenced by adults than by teenagers. The mid-adolescents um, were influenced by both adults and teenagers similarly. There was no difference between the amount of influence coming from adults and teenagers for mid-adolescents, whereas the young adolescents showed the completely re the reverse tendency. Their risk ratings were more influenced, they changed more, uh, were, but um, according to the uh, risk ratings of teenagers compared with adults. So what this suggests is that young adolescents risk perception is influenced more by other teenagers, by people their own age than it is by adults. Now, I mentioned that Lisa carried out uh, this study kind of twice. She, she carried it out in two completely separate independent samples a couple of years apart. 
Um, one in the first sample, that's what I've just shown you here, 563 participants. In the second study, there were 590 completely different participants. And we replicated this effect. So we think that this is a pretty robust effect whereby young adolescents are more influenced by people their own age than by adults. Now that's really interesting because it has implications for things like public health, trying to change uh, young people's attitudes and behavior. Um, uh, for example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, an example from a, um, a public health research study, which, did, which looked at just that. So this is a, um, a study a few years ago by Palak and colleagues looking at a peer-led anti-bullying intervention. So in this, it was a kind of like a randomized cluster, cluster, a cluster randomized control trial in which 56 middle schools, so this is the US and New Jersey, middle schools go from about age 11 to 15 years. Um, half of the schools carried out their anti-bullying campaigns as normal. They all had them all led by teachers in class. And the other half of the schools were, um, select group of students from the schools were educated about the harmful effects of bullying and social exclusion and were then incentivized to lead their own campaigns amongst their amongst their peers in school so they did things like poster campaigns and um uh i don't know debates and parties and that kind of thing and what they found was that the uh, bullying and student conflict was reduced by about 25% over the ensuing year in schools where the interventions were led by students, that's here, compared with the control schools in which the interventions or the anti-bullying campaigns were led by teachers. So this suggests that, you know, students really do have the power to influence each other in positive ways. Um, the effect was stronger when the students leading the campaigns were more highly connected, so knew more students were, were liked by more students. Um, just as a little aside, uh, a couple of years ago, at the beginning of the COVID-19 or a few months into the COVID-19 pandemic, um, some of my colleagues and I wrote a little paper on, on this because we thought that um, rather than, you know, the kind of shaming campaigns that were very popular in the summer of 2020, shaming young people for going out and not obeying the, um, the kind of social distancing rules, um, I don't know if you remember that, but it was it was very much prevalent across the world, in fact, not just in this country. We were arguing that actually that probably won't have much effect at all, shaming them and telling them what to do. And in fact, in, instead, what would have been more influential would be to um, have the young people themselves uh, um, run their own campaigns and try to influence each other. I don't think anyone listened to that because I haven't seen anything like that done yet. OK, so. Um, just to say uh, one more thing about this, this, this area of research is that um, we have proposed that uh, what, you know, we, we stereotypically think about adolescents as risk takers, but actually perhaps we should think about them more as risk averse when it comes to taking social risks. But what I mean by social risks is the risk of being socially excluded. Um, so if you and if you just to kind of put this in concrete terms, give you an example, if you think about a typical, you know, teenage girl uh, who is offered a cigarette by her friends at the weekend, um, what is the more risky thing for her to do, say, saying um, yes to a cigarette, even though she knows it carries health risks or saying no and potentially being socially excluded from her peer group. But we would argue that actually avoiding social risk, avoiding being ostracized by one's peer group might matter more to adolescents than avoiding other types of risks like health risks or legal risks and that it's not to condone those decisions but it's to sort of shed those seemingly bad decisions in a more rational light it really matters to teenagers to to go along with their friends and to be accepted by their peer group probably for good evolutionary reasons as well okay so i'm going to i'm going to tell you one more uh, about one more study on um on, on uh, peer influence, and then I'll move on to social distancing briefly. Okay, so this is just to say that it's not just um, risk-taking where peers have a particularly profound influence on each other in adolescence. It also happens for other types of decision like pro-social decisions. So this was a, um, uh, a study led by my postdoc, Ga Gabriella Cecchia, 
uh, on pro-social influence on charity donations. He tested 220 participants aged between 11 to 35 years on a very, very similar task to the one I just described. But here, um, instead of risk ratings, these were actual charity donations. So we gave each participant an amount of money and on each trial, they could give away some of their money to various different charities, climate change, children's charities, animals, animal charities. So we ask how much do you want to donate to each charity? And then we tell them, ah, oh, right. So all the teenagers that have taken part so far, this is how much they donated to this same charity. And you, you donated this amount. Um, do you want to change your donation? So we're interested again in social influence, but in this, um, in this study, we also manipulated whether the, the provided um, donations here, so the observed donations, were either higher, as in this case, more pro-social than the participants' first donation, or lower and more selfish than the participants' first donation. And that's what I'm going to focus on when I show you the results in the next slide. Okay. So first of all, what we found was that young adolescents are more pro-socially influenced than other age groups. Um, so this. These are for the selfish um, donations. That is the donations where the provided donation, the observed donation was less than the, um, the participants original donation. And this is the young adolescents, mid adolescents and adults who took part. And in, uh, in contrast, this is where the observed donations were higher. So more pro-social than the participants original donation. And what you can see first of all, is that only in the pro-social case, not the selfish case, young adolescents are more um, in pro-socially influenced. They change their ratings to be, they change their donations to be more generous when they see that other people have been more generous than them compared with mid adolescents and adults. So again, we find that young adolescents are more pro-socially influenced in this case than other age groups. We also found that um, the adults show this um, opportunistic, opportunistic conformity, selfish conformity, where if they see other, um, uh, other people being less generous than them, then they're very happy to be less generous in there. They're very happy to change their donation to be less. And that's not the case, or it's less the case for the pro for when the observed donations are pro-social. Um, so that's kind of an interesting one, and suggests that 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 tendency for opportunistic conformity uh, starts to come online in adulthood, and perhaps is less the case for adolescents. Okay, so in the final few minutes of this talk, I want to briefly mention our current research. I don't really have any data here. I have one data slide at the end because we're right in the middle of carrying out lots of different studies on social isolation and social distancing and loneliness. Now, I have been telling you that the social brain and social behavior changes in adolescence. And the way I think of adolescence is a, is a sensitive period for social development in particular. Now that's not my idea. That's an idea that's come out of much research, particularly in animals um, from, from many, many decades ago. So for example, um, lots of studies have looked at what happens as a consequence of social isolation in various different developmental periods in um in in rodents now one thing i should say here is that all species of animal undergo a period of adolescence between puberty and becoming fully sexually mature rats undergo about 35 days of adolescence between puberty and becoming fully sexually mature adults and in that 35 days you can you can uh, um measure their behavior and many many studies have done just that but the, these studies focus on uh, what the question what happens to brain behavior, mental health, I guess you could call it, <laughs> uh, if you socially isolate a rat in adolescence. And many, many studies have shown more or less the same thing. And that is that social isolation in adolescence in rats has a unique and arguably more damaging effect on behavior and brain development compared with the same social isolation either before puberty or in adulthood. So there's something about the adolescent period in animals whereby they require um, social interaction with peers in adolescence in order for their brains to develop normally, optimally, and, and uh, subsequent behavioral development to ensue normally. So, okay, I think you might be getting what I'm saying here. That we don't know very much about the effects of social isolation 
on in adolescent on human adolescence because the studies just haven't really been done. I mean, you can see that there are kind of ethical issues with those studies, although we're currently doing one, um, which I will briefly mention in a second. But the idea here is that perhaps in humans, periods of social isolation or even social deprivation, so not complete isolation, but reduced social interaction, like was the case during our various lockdowns, um, might have damaging effects on brain and behavior in humans and not just in animals. And that is a really big concern because of the social distancing and lockdowns that are happening all over the world, um, still continuing to happen um, uh, for, for, for all of us. But uh, the particular concern is for children to a certain extent, extent, but particularly for adolescents who really do seem to need to interact with their peers um, and are kind of driven to interact with their peers. So just a couple of things about that. With um, Livia Tomo Tomova, who's a research fellow in my lab, and our colleague in Cambridge, Amy Auburn, we are now studying um, social isolation and loneliness in adolescents. Um, interestingly, a study from the BBC published a few years ago um, surprisingly showed that 16 to 24 year olds report the highest loneliness levels in the UK compared with other age groups. That might go against what you would expect. But this, the, our young people are, are a lonely group of people. And that was before the pandemic. Um, we wrote about the effects of loneliness in, um, in the pandemic. And low, you know, not surprisingly, there have been lots and lots of studies in the last two years showing that loneliness has um, been really high for particular groups and in particular for young people, for adolescents. So what we're really interested in is whether, um, given that loneliness is associated with mental health problems, substance abuse and physical illness, we're interested in what are the effects of social isolation and social distancing on that adolescent brain, behavior and mental health. Uh, we are currently ca carrying out various different studies to look at this. One is one big, um, uh, fMRI study and structural MRI study where we're looking at um, we, we, we have a kind of social isolation paradigm where we isolate people in a room, a nice room with food and a bathroom and things to do, but with no social interaction. They can't bring their phones. They can't even bring books with people in or watch TV or anything like that. They are socially isolated for a few hours to look at the effect of, of um of that social isolation on various behavioral paradigms and also on various mental health questionnaires. Um, and we also have a condition where the same thing happens, they're in a room uh, with nothing, except in this case, they are allowed to bring their phone and they're allowed to communicate with their friends on their phone because one of our hypotheses, and this is the kind of more positive um, angle on the, on the, in this area, is that digital means of social connection, in other words, um, you know, using social media to, or texting or whatever to co connect with your friends might mitigate the potentially harmful effects of social isolation and social distancing. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that it's a good thing that we've, in the last two years, we, we had the ability to communicate online, particularly for adolescents. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave it there and summarize. So just to summarize, the social brain develops throughout adolescence, as does most of the cortex. Um, social risk avoidance is an important determinant of adolescent typical behavior, such as risk taking. Um, adolescence might be a sensitive period of brain development, conferring both vulnerability to things like dangerous risk taking and mental health problems, but also opportunity, things like learning and creativity and interventions and rehabilitation. And I just mentioned uh, at the end that our current interest in it is in how um, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and associated lockdowns and social distancing, how that is affecting young people's development. So just to um, whoops, um, say thank you. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you to my research group who've been involved in all these studies I've talked about. And thank you to my funding. And I'm very happy to answer questions. I think there's a few minutes. I will stop sharing. Super, thanks so much, Sir James. A, a, a fantastic wide ranging talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, very current with the, uh, the kinds of experiences that, that adolescents have, have been through in the last couple of years. So for everyone, if you want to stick any questions into the chat bar, I will uh, pass those on to Sarah Jane. I can see um, while you're typing away, um, I get the opportunity to ask the first question. So, um, 
yeah, let's try with, um, do you think there's something different in, in risk taking about the kind of mechanisms of decision making in, in adolescence? Or do you think they just don't have enough wisdom about what the actual risks are? And, and I ask because um, is what is the right response for, for, for teachers in secondary schools? Is it to try and uh, appraise teenagers of actually how dangerous it is to drive fast? Or, or is this something that's outside of teachers' controls because kids are just going to take risks? Great question. Um, the, 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 there's quite a lot known about that. So I could answer it from various different angles, but basically the upshot is that teenagers are very well educated about risk. They understand risk. There's no evidence they don't understand risk. There's no evidence that they feel invincible to risk. If you, if you do these risk-taking paradigms where, with participants on their own I haven't really talked about that very much but um there are yeah lots of different risk-taking paradigms if you test um adolescent participants on their own they make similar risky decisions as adults do it's when they're with their friends that that changes their risk-taking decision so in other words really the context matters and if they're in an optimal environment on their own able to focus not being distracted by their friends not trying to impress their friends then they don't seem to take any more or different risks than adults in, in most risk-taking paradigms, or at least the kind of ecologically va valid risk-taking paradigms. Um, so it's more a question, I would argue, of, of course we need to educate adolescents about risk, for sure, and that's where adults come in as really important in that kind of scaffolding and educate, education uh, element. But what I think is possibly more important is, um, or as important, is educating adolescents about the, um, the pro their natural propensity in many cases to be influenced by their peers and how to handle that in the heat of the moment. How are they, you know, they might not want to take that drug or whatever, uh, but in the heat of the moment when their friends are taking that drug and sort of pressurizing them to, how are they gonna say no, it's really difficult. Whereas they, they wouldn't, you know, when they're on, on their own, that decision would be a very different decision for them. Great, thank you. I've mm -hmm. uh, got a question from Alistair who says, do you predict that uh, gray, to white, gray to white matter changes will be similar in other cultures where adolescents are treated differently perhaps? Is this oh. a feature of westernized, infantized mm -hmm. brains? Thank you for asking that. I actually just like a minute before the talk deleted a slide on that because I thought I've got way too many slides. <laughs> um, so the answer is we don't really know because there is not much brain imaging done in very different cultures. So just first of all, to say you're completely right, adolescents are treated very differently in different cultures. There are hugely different societal expectations of this age group over here in Western cultures like in the UK versus in other cultures around the world. And we do some research, for example, in South Africa and Uganda where, you know, that just to give an example, young people are absolutely expected in these cultures to be much more independent at a much earlier age, earn their own money, have babies as soon as they reach sexual maturity. N not always, but um, that you know, there's a there's a very very different cultural environment for that young people grow up in. Um, now, we don't know much about how their brains develop because the brain imaging studies just haven't been done in those communities. They tend to be very poor communities, and brain imaging is well. It's, a, it's an interesting one. Brain imaging is very expensive. There's a huge amount. So some of my colleagues in the US have funding to go and scan development of the brain in, in children and adolescents in these countries. But generally speaking, it's really impossible to do that because, of, because the communities are so poor that the community leaders would rather have, you know, have the money spent in different ways to help their community, which makes, which makes sense. Okay, but what we do know is that, so we don't know much about the about brain development in these different cultures, but we do know a little bit about behavioral development. So a study led by um, Larry Steinberg a few years ago, uh, looked at behaviors like risk taking and sensation seeking in uh, 11 different cultures around the world, very different cultures in 11 different countries. And what they found was that the developmental trajectory of risk taking and sensation seeking was remarkably similar across 11 different cultures. It increased during, in almost all the cultures, it increased during the teenage years, was highest in the late teens and then decreased again in the twenties. So that does suggest that independent of 
um, societal expectations of this age group. There are some similarities in these um, in these uh, uh, behavioral in in this beha behavioral development. Um, And finally, <laughs> just thinking I knew I have one more thing to say about that. There are people who study cultural differences in different cultures in the same town. So for example, um, Andrew Fellini and Adriana Galvan in UCLA, so they're in Los Angeles, they study um, uh, behavior <clears throat> and brain function in children and adolescents, particularly adolescents, in, in LA who were either from Hispanic families, very sort of tight-knit Hispanic families and non-Hispanic families. So they're matched in all sorts of other ways. Like they live in the same city. They, uh, say they match them for things like socioeconomic status and all sorts of other things. And they do see differences, subtle but significant differences between, particularly between uh, their, their, behav their behavioral development. So things like um, uh, their focus on the family versus peers is different and their brains process uh, social information in, in very, very subtly different ways. But overall, brain development is likely to be very similar across cultures. There might be subtle differences because we know that brain development is influenced by the environment, including the social cultural environment, but overall, probably brain development will be largely similar. Super, thanks. A uh, couple of uh, uh, more kind of educational questions or, or practical. Can you recommend any accessible resources to share with parents around adolescent brain development and the impact of the pandemic. That's from uh, Danielle. Um, we don't really know how the how the pandemic has influenced brain development. I don't think I know of any data for, on actual brain development, but there's a huge amount of data coming out on um, of, of, of the effects of the pandemic on things like mental health in particular. Um, there are studies by um, um, Tamsin Ford at Cambridge and Daisy Fancourt uh, at UCL and Kathy Creswell in Oxford. And all of these studies very well controlled with baseline data from before the pandemic on large numbers of participants show that th there are huge individual differences. That's one really important thing. It's not like all children and adolescents have really suffered in terms of their mental health, but there has been a really big increase in mental health problems in the last in the last 22 months, whatever it is now. Um, and that is thought to be due to, well, all sorts of elements of the pandemic, but largely probably the, the school closures and, so, and, and, the, and the lockdowns. But other things as well, like, you know, worry, anxiety about the virus and worry about people dying and that kind of thing. Um, I, if, you want, if you want specific studies, then write to me and I'll um, just email me and I'll send them to you. Super, thanks. Uh, Roxana uh, has a question about homeschooling and how that would fit on the isolation mm -hmm. kind of spectrum. I, I can imagine for a policymaker, is it worth the risk to put the kids back in school? Or, or do, you, do you mitigate a lot of the social isolation by allowing individuals to, to interact with through homeschooling? Um, do you mean homeschooling like outside the pandemic? So people who choose to homeschool? Oh, online or... homeschooling, yeah, I'm, I guess. Uh, um, or remote learning. Yeah. Um, you mean, sorry, I'm just trying to understand the question. You mean remote learning? As a yeah yeah so when when everyone's told to stay at home and do their lessons online okay okay yeah well i mean that's a good question as well uh, and, and and interestingly not much is known about the difference between say learning um through face-to-face -face, um classes versus online classes like what you know what are the key differences i i'm sure they're vast we, we're just doing some um systematic reviews on this on this at the moment um but I guess I guess what I'd say there is that it doesn't compare, you know, online learning, online social interaction doesn't really compare to face to face. It's very different, but it's better than nothing. It's better than not having any kind of, uh, you know, interaction in any way with other with teachers or other other pupils. Um, I or I just think, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet. We only had landlines. We didn't have. Um, mobiles or anything like that and I think god if this pandemic happened when I was a teenager I mean you literally wouldn't have been able to interact with any peers at all for months on online of course not online there was no such thing as online the only possibility was a landline call but you know that was there's one landline in a house and 
not and they were quite expensive you could you could oh, write long letters like they did in the 19th century <laughs> couldn't you I'll, I'll just take uh, one last question we, we have a range of questions and i'm sorry i haven't had a chance to get to them all uh so i know you, you can't tackle everything in your studies and you have very big samples of, of adolescence i just had a, a question from naomi about did you notice any patterns in outliers in your data uh, she's wondering whether your cohorts include any adolescents with ADHD or other neurodivergence. So does it particularly impact some minority groups more than others? Um, well, we tend not to include people with diagnoses of um, neurodevelopmental conditions, um, partly because our tasks are just not designed to like for example with dyslexia we often have this issue as i'm sure other people do in the audience if you if you work with children and adolescents where we we are worried about including people with sort of severe moderate to severe dyslexia because most of our studies involve just incidentally lots of speed reading at speed and we don't feel like it's fair on participants to put them under that pressure if they have dyslexia um, similarly we tend not to include young people with a diagnosis of ADHD or autism. I think, you know, we yes, we do have large studies, but we don't really have large enough studies to be able to look at kind of subgroups. Um, however, so my, my, my answer to that isn't very satisfactory because we don't really have any data on that, but other groups around the world, uh, that's exactly what they're interested in. So lots of, there are lo there's lots of um, uh, research on the neurocognitive development, so brain development and cognitive development in children and adolescents, for example, with ADHD, with autism, with other neurodevelopmental um, um, uh, diversity. And yeah, I mean, I can't really summarize it all, but it's all very interesting. And again, it's like these subtle, well, the way I think of it, okay, so the, my, I suppose if this is the last question, the last thing I'd say is that development is so important. If you, if you take a snapshot of, say, the brain of um, people with ADHD, say, at 18 versus people without ADHD at 18, they look pretty similar. The brain isn't dramatically different. However, if you look at the developmental trajectory, in other words, how what happened before 18 and up to 18, you do see subtle but significant differences in the trajectories. So um, there might be a difference in slope of gray matter development, for example. And the way I think of it is like, you can get to a destination via, you know, going to a destination in a car via two different routes. You can take the motorway or you can take the A roads. You might get there at exactly the same time. You might get to the same destination at the same time, but the route is very different and that route in development really matters, it seems. Super, thanks very much. So we'll, we'll let you go. Thanks to everyone for all those fantastic questions. I'm sorry, I couldn't get to all of them, but uh, primarily thanks. thanks to Sarah Jane for oh, a, a fascinating talk. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and uh, yeah, everyone visit her website, lots of fantastic stuff there. And you had a book out recently, didn't you? The Secret Life, uh, Secret Life of the Adolescent Brain. So, uh, uh, go look at that on amazon so mm -hmm. thanks again sarah jane thanks Thank to everyone you. and uh, i hope you'll you'll join us at the next uh center for education on your science seminar thanks everyone